Welcome to the second episode of a two podcast series directed and produced by the students of the 2022 to 2026 cohort of the Welcome Trust PhD in Mental Health Science. Today, we will be showcasing an interview conducted with Sir Lewis Appleby, who is a professor of psychiatry at the University of Manchester and director of the National Confidential Inquiry into Suicide and Safety. His area of expertise is in suicide prevention, and he'll be giving a keynote talk called Suicide Prevention, Is It Possible? at the fourth annual Institute of Mental Health International Conference taking place in September 2023 at UCL. In this talk, we ask Sir Lewis Appleby about his thoughts on the topic as a preview to his presentation. Joining us is Professor Sir Lewis Appleby, who is a professor of psychiatry at the University of Manchester and director of the National Confidential Inquiry into Suicide and Safety in Mental Health. He was knighted earlier this year for services to medicine and mental health, and at the UCL Institute of Mental Health Conference in September 2023, he will be giving a keynote talk entitled Suicide Prevention, Is It Possible? This podcast gives us a chance to discuss this incredibly complex and important topic as a preview of that presentation. I wondered if you could start off by just talking a little bit about what you mean or what you understand by suicide prevention and what the goals of suicide prevention policy actually are in the UK. When I first got into uh, talking about suicide prevention, there was a general sense that it was the natural mortality associated with mental illness. And therefore, the main targets of prevention were things that were hard to change were beyond the scope of what we could reasonably hope to to uh, manipulate. So uh, I suppose uh, I, I set out to uh, to challenge that point of view and show that it's more uh, complex than that. So I think there has been a change in clinical attitudes, a change in public attitudes, uh, and a change, of course, in the evidence, which uh, is what encourages us. During the 1930s, when there was a, a worldwide depression, um, and suicide rates in many parts of the world, including in this country, um, escalated. Suicide was driven by the, the unemployment rate and by the global economy. And I think it, it, it created a kind of fatalism in professionals, a sense that they, they couldn't do anything about it. And, and, um, and so some of us were dissatisfied with that. We, I suppose in clinical practice, we felt we were doing things which kept people safer. And we wanted to be able to demonstrate that experimentally and in research, and transfer that, that, that clinical experience into something which was then more generalizable and could shape services in the future. And that's really what, what we've been about over the last, I suppose, um, 30 years. We're moving into another period, I think, where we have to be able to balance what we know about suicide prevention for everyone, um, um, and yet at the same time, what we can say about a particular individual. What does this mean for you as a person? Because each person, of course, is different from other person, and their, their combination of risk factors will be different. And that balance, the individual versus society, is where we've always been. And so with this change in attitude and thinking about suicide not as inevitable, but as perhaps preventable, um, the National Suicide Prevention Strategy, for example, which I know you were heavily involved in, included, I believe, a commitment to reduce the suicide rate in England by 10%, for example. And there seems to be a lot of focus still on um, reducing the rate of suicide. But I was just wondering what you thought about the idea that every suicide might be preventable and is it an achievable goal to prevent every suicide that happens and ultimately reduce the rate of suicide to zero? No, it's not possible to reduce it to zero, uh, unless we discover something in the future which is so dramatically new um, that uh, we, we can uh, understand all, all the complexities I'm referring to, all the, the complexity of people's lives and how they get into situations of crisis and, des and despair. Uh, the idea that we could reduce all of that, that's that breadth of human experience to uh, to, to zero suicide is is um, is not realistic and and in fact a distraction from what we we need to be able to do. Um, but um, how do we then view you know what is the job of a strategy? In two thousand and two, when we we had the first suicide prevention strategy, um, it was then about saying something new that this was a government that the government at that time was committing to uh, something which had otherwise been left, I suppose, to services. It's a statement of government priority, a government saying this matters, this actually matters, that we have to do something about it. Um, and then, of course, a lot follows from that. Other organisations uh, pick up the message and say, OK, well, what can we contribute? And, and so they, they develop their own approach to suicide prevention. And so it triggers a whole set of uh, a, a kind of wave of activity it has to say there is something here for everybody, uh, that uh, no matter who you are, no matter what group you're in, 
there's something that we can do better to help you stay safer. I wanted to loop back to uh, the point about suicide and on experiences online, because obviously suicide among young people is a very important priority in suicide prevention. Um, and a lot of the concerns have been raised about suicide in young people relating to experiences online, for example, online forums where suicide and self-harm are encouraged. So I was just wondering, do you think that the digital age brings new challenges to suicide prevention in that way? Well, suicide is constantly changing because the, the nature of people's lives changes and the online um, environment, the technology and the the different way of relating to people. Obviously, that's a massive, you know, massive change for society. And although I must say this is not just a young person's issue, I should just point that out, that uh, what the risks online apply to all groups, but maybe in particular to young people. And the, the, um, the, the, so, so it's a very important area. Uh, it has been difficult to address for a number of reasons. One important one uh, is that uh, some of the online risk uh, relates to sites which are hard to get at because they're not uh, cited in this country. So they, they are beyond the scope of laws on uh, encouraging suicide because they're happening outside. If you could even get through to them technically, then it would still be hard for police to bring prosecutions because of where they might be in the world. There are dangers, and those dangers could be regulated, and governments have a responsibility. So trying to regulate um, online risk is a huge step forward. Um, and although the, the current bill that's been uh, in Parliament doesn't do everything, uh, far from it, uh, it, it, sometimes with government legislation, that initial step is the decisive step. The thing I would, I would most like to see happen, but I don't think it will be in this particular bill, is the point about these so-called pro-suicide sites. Um, and these pro-suicide sites are uh, they're dangerous because they are promoting suicide, encouraging, sometimes goading, actually, people who are in distress. Um, they're disingenuous because they will sometimes say, well, we're providing support because we're allowing people to talk about suicide. Of course, people do need to be able to talk about how they're feeling without just producing alarm in the, in the person listening. But there are other places where that can happen. Uh, and, um, so that, that, and, then, and then I think they are directly dangerous by talking about suicide methods, which um, uh, aren't well, well known. Um, if, we, if we can close down those sites um, through international action, then that would be a very positive thing. Thank you. And... Uh, aside from online experiences, do you think there are any other potential social or economic challenges that will make it harder to prevent suicides going forward? One of the biggest um, things we face, of course, is the cost of living crisis. If you look at what happened in 2008 with the recession then, suicide rate was coming down. I mean, the, the suicide rate in 2007 was the lowest suicide rate ever in England. Um, it changed. The global recession hit. It's a, it's a terrible reflection of how global the global world operates, and uh, um, and uh, these people's lives became tougher, and they people lost their jobs or feared they lost their jobs, and it didn't stop there. They uh, they got into debt. People getting you know it, it's debt, and then uh, they couldn't pay their rent, couldn't pay mortgages, so they're in danger of losing their homes, and so the stresses accumulate. The financial stresses accumulate. So we uh, we have to be conscious of how that might play out in suicide rates. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we've talked about how the rates of suicide have varied over the last few years. And we said, as you said, that COVID actually didn't have as much of an impact as we thought it might, which is very good. Um, but I just wondered, since the National Suicide Prevention Strategy was last published, which was in 2012, how do you feel that that has gone? How do you feel that, how successful do you feel that these goals have been? Do you think there are more and less successful policies that came from that strategy? The, the recent history of suicide rates in this country show prevention is possible. Uh, the rates since 2002 have been 20% lower than rates in the two decades before that. So rate, it doesn't mean the strategy did that, but it does mean that the rate came down. But it also shows another thing, and the, 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 the but, the, the thing that goes wrong. Uh, in 2008 was the recession, so you can never drop your vigilance. Uh, I, think we, I think we've come through a recession, got the rates down again to one of the lowest on record, We've come through a, a global pandemic without a rise. Uh, and so in, in, those, in that sense, I think there have been some important achievements. I don't think we can always say that it's the strategy that's done that. But for the reasons I said at the beginning, the sense of combined activity, government priority, all of that adds up to a focus on suicide. Thank you so much. I think that brings us to the end of the main body. But there is one extra question that we want to ask. 
Um, so ahead of the IOMH conference, we are also speaking to Dr. Scott Kim, who is an expert in the ethics of assisted dying, and he'll be giving a keynote presentation entitled Assisted Suicide and Mental Disorder. We wanted to pose this question to both of you. Do efforts to prevent suicide and to allow assisted dying contradict each other, or do you think they're part of the same conversation? Usually when we talk about suicide prevention, we don't talk about assisted dying, because I, I think it is, it is a, it's, it's a different question. Um, but I don't think you, you can't escape from the fact it's a related question, um, because it is also about the, the value that society puts on human life. Um, and it is also about this point about personal and individual autonomy, uh, which has been one of the changes in, in how suicide prevention has gone over the last uh, couple of decades. So I, I, I think it is a different question. So a suicide prevention strategy won't address assisted dying um, because, because it's different. Um, uh, I must say, I think the people I know who've talked about assisted dying, they don't always welcome the suggestion that what they're talking about is a version of suicide. They're talking about something else, which is about um, looking after their own lives. Um, and the word, whereas the word suicide has connotations that they find unwelcome. Uh, so so I, I think it's a general sense that it's not part of a suicide prevention strategy. Having said that, um, you, you, when you look at how assisted dying has uh, played out, um, in countries that have adopted it, um, if we take, say, Belgium and the Netherlands, uh, the, it, it has been quite difficult to set limits on assisted dying. Um, so it starts off with a very humane and understandable sense that the individual should control the end of their life if they have a terminal illness and are suffering. And it's very hard to disagree with the principles behind that. But when you get into the practicalities, you found that countries that have in, introduced assisted dying have then had to say, um, well, how does that play out for people whose suffering is psychological? Um, and is it possible to uh, have a measure for physical suffering but not psychological suffering without saying something demeaning about psychological suffering? And so they've brought psychological suffering into the, into the scope of the legislation. Uh, and then uh, the question is, well, does it have to be a terminal condition or can it just be an unbearable condition? Uh, and in these countries, that's where they've ended up. And, if, and as a result, people can be referred for mental health conditions for assisted dying or euthanasia. They can be referred for that. And it's part of the law. Uh, and now we've got research publications which show who ends up in that situation. And it's sometimes the people who's, who mental health services um, uh, have not been historically very good at responding to. So people with personality disorder, people with intractable depression. Um, and so if we come back, and so those are the people who, who can end up in, a, in what starts out as a humane intention, but ends up uh, deciding that the lives of some of our most vulnerable people are not worth the lives that, uh, of other groups. And, um, and that's where, for me, um, it becomes impossible to justify. So suicide prevention has been my career. And when I see some of the people who I most have worried about ending up in a situation of what we call assisted dying, because the law allows it, I find that unacceptable. So it's not the initial principle, it's where it has taken us that, uh, for me, is the, is the problem. Professor Sir Lewis Appleby, thank you so much. Thank you for tuning in for this important discussion about suicide prevention with Professor Sir Lewis Appleby and the students of the Wellcom Trust PhD in Mental Health Science. The International Conference at the Institute of Mental Health at UCL will be taking place on September 20th from 9.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. and will be covering a diverse range of topics on mental health research, featuring internationally renowned expert speakers from UCL and beyond.